Oh, baby, we are back with another great episode and a fantastic guest, none other than the one and only Ross Simmons in the house, best-selling author of Create Once, Distribute Forever. Ross, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. And I love hearing that word, bestseller. I, lo I love to hear it. So thanks for bringing me on. Super excited to talk about Create Once, Distribute Forever and all things distribution. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about this. Obviously, uh, I want to give people a little backstory here. So yeah. When I was in the first like infancy stages before even building out anything that I even thought could be something, right. I created my first ever blog. It was called Fundamental Mindset. And it was right after I got out of college. And I remember I came across this dude, Ross. And, <laughs> you know, I had just followed him. I, I was trying to be like, who, who is this dude? And like, he was giving good vibes back then in 2015, 2016. I didn't really do much with it. I was just writing my first book and then, and then, Fast forward to January, 2024, I'm at Traffic and Conversion in Vegas and Ross is there speaking. I'm like, I know this dude, but like, <laughs> I was like, but I have no idea how. So right. we end up connecting, we talk ball, we talk a few things yeah. and I find, I go back in the archives and I find from an old, old Gmail account right. that I had reached out to you about a freebie you had given a long time ago. I'd always remember your name and, and the right. look. And then here we are now. You <laughs> got an incredible book out and we're going to talk about it. I Amazing. It. You know, it's a testament to the long game. Like we've been connected for a very long time. And I think a lot of people will sleep on the power of just like a simple email response. Because if I would have ghosted you, if I would have gave you a cold shoulder, that would have ruined a relationship that didn't have any touch points for like, years, right? So um, I'm grateful that we were able to finally connect in the flesh and that we were able to connect way back in the day when I had less hair, less babies. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a lot of, that was a whole different life ago. Dude, I, I hear you. I mean, I, I just think of, you know, I think of what can happen. And that was yeah. about eight years ago at the time of this recording. Right. I think of just what, what, what changes in eight years, right? And yeah. for both of us, we've evolved so much in the work that we do. Um, right. But I want to hear your journey, okay? I want the right. people to know a little bit about your story, all right? We're going to talk a lot today about the new book that's out. Incredible. Sure. But, but talk to us about the journey of how you went from content strategy to distribution mm. and kind of the evolution that is Ross. Yeah. So the evolution of me started at a young age. I've always loved creating things. Like I've been a, a creating geek for a long time, whether I was creating board games that I would sell in school, whether I was creating businesses where I sold do rags out of my locker, or I created a website where I was talking about the Sims or Madden or basketball, all kinds of things. Like I was a, a hardcore creator and I just loved it my whole life. Then you fast forward into my years in university and I was writing a lot of content online on the internet about things like fantasy sports. I was trying to get traction in that industry and in that niche. And the moment that I got a big break where I started to actually be able to pay for my tuition was when I started to distribute the content that I was creating on my fantasy football blog into other communities where fantasy football fanatics were spending time. That's when the light bulbs went off. It's cool that I'm creating good content, but if nobody saw that content, then it was for nothing. Unfortunately, as the traffic and the revenue from the fantasy side went up, my marks went down. So my mom made me switch my fantasy blog to a marketing blog. So I started to write about marketing and I started to distribute and apply that same methodology to this blog. I started to distribute my content in various communities and I started to get DMs and emails from some of the top brands in the world. Now I live in a small place called Nova Scotia on the East coast of Canada. I'm from a small community called Preston, which is like probably 2000, 3000 people. And there was no one in my world and in my circle that knew anything about digital marketing. No one knew even like most people didn't know what SaaS was. And that's like the bread and butter where I work today. So I needed to break out. And the way that I could break out was on the back of content and distributing this content to a bunch of businesses, a bunch of leaders through these communities gave me the opportunity to expand my reach on a global level where I've been able to do business with businesses and organizations all over the globe. Um, and it's because I created assets that were ridiculously valuable. So create something once and then I distributed it like wildfire. I would share it on LinkedIn. I would seed it into emails. Uh, it would be in my subject line. It would be in my PS. It would be on my LinkedIn. It'd be on Instagram. It'd be on my Facebook. It'd be in groups. It'd be in newsletters, emails, all of the things. And that journey took me to where I am today. 
where I eventually said, okay, not only do I need to do this for myself, but I want to do this for clients. And then we had clients who wanted to live and breathe that same mentality of creating things that are ridiculously valuable and then unlocking the power of distribution on the back of it. Dude, I love it. I love it. What a journey. And and, and we're going to dig deep into that, but I'm going to, I'm going to go for a controversial topic potentially. Let's do it. Let's do it. When you look at some of these people who are uh, building out content engines, right? Yeah. And you look at some of them and they're crushing the content game. A lot of times you'll hear two, two conflicting opinions. Mm. Go for a high level of quantity because right. more posts, more chances of being seen. Right. Some of them you hear do the same content, but put a different hook on it every single time. Same exact video, just change the thumbnail image and do that 50 times. Yep. Or focus just on the quality of the content. Right. What right. has kind of been your perspective from right. creating a lot of content, but also distributing really well and making that a, a cornerstone of yeah. your success and your client's success? I used to always ask people, would you rather have 10 great pieces or 100 mediocre pieces? And the amount of energy that goes into each is probably the same equivalent, or at least it was until AI showed up. Now you can create 10 amazing pieces or about a thousand mediocre pieces with AI, maybe 10,000 mediocre pieces because of AI. So the bar of creating mediocrity has reduced. It's way easier now than ever before to create mediocre content. It's way easier now to create average assets and just change the hook and share it to other places. Way easier to do that now. But if you can start with high quality and then turn those high quality assets into little pieces and take elements of high quality and distribute those, that's where I believe the unfair advantage is unlocked because AI has made it easier for everyone to create mediocre content. So in a sea of mediocrity, the only way to stand out is to be above average. And the only way to be average is to actually be better than the AI. So how can I create content and develop stories that are better than AI? I have to actually spend more time and energy. And I know that that's not a hack. I know that that's not like an easy path that people would love to be able to say, oh yes, that's exactly it. Thank you, Rush, you gave me so much value. I'm gonna be able to win because I'm gonna spend more time. People won't thank me for that because it means more time. But that is where the actual biggest returns are gonna come from. They're going to come from you saying, I'm going to investigate this problem more. I'm going to talk to more people who have gone through this and share their story. That is where I see the opportunity to take unscalable content, things that are not easily replicated, and then distribute that through multiple assets and apply some of the first principles that you talked about. Yes, mm -hmm. if I have a ridiculously valuable hook and I change the intro or a valuable asset and I change the intro, I change elements of it and I start to reshare that, chef's kiss. That's gonna work wonders for you. But if you have mediocre content and you do it, you're gonna just keep getting mediocre results. So my advice is lean heavily into that idea of creating best in class content and then distributing that in a bunch of different ways. What a, what a reframe on that. And I, and I think it's one of the reasons why I've become such a big fan of books and how books can become your content and a big part of your, your strategy yeah. because people don't just write a shitty book normally. Like most people right. who care, right. who care, like you're going to put in the time and the effort, right? You're going to put right. the best of the best information that you have right. into this, right? That's why people are like, you can get someone's 20 years of experience for $20, right? That's it. Like we can pay you thousands, thousands of dollars, or we can get your book, right? right. Like, right. like people can do the same thing for me. And so I, I always tell people, and I love the title of your book, create once, distribute forever, because I Appreciate always tell people that with your book is like, create the book once. Yeah. And then you have an asset forever. You have right. an opportunity to use that thing in a million different ways. But right. you know it's on the foundation of something that is true to you, authentic mm -hmm. to you, and typically represents you in the way you want to be seen, yeah. which is so, so powerful. So let's talk about this because you are the distribution expert, okay? Right. And you talk about creating these high quality content pieces and then allowing to be, be distributed, which... Yeah. With the right systems, okay, right. and maybe I'm incorrect here, but with the right systems, with the right mm -hmm. tech, with the right tools, those yep. 10 pieces of good content could become 100 or 1,000 pieces of exactly. still elements of a great piece versus right. just mediocrity from the get-go. So That's it. 
what do you recommend as that first piece of content? Yeah. And does it differ between industries, differ between brands, differ between right. entrepreneurs versus companies? Where do you find that first pillar of content yeah. to be? And then where do we start to distribute it next? There are three key formats that are highly repurposable on the internet. There's video content, yeah. audio content, and written content. Of all those formats, only one of them very easily translates to the rest, and that's video. So video content, in my, in my opinion, is one of the most versatile and valuable types of content assets that you can create. It's also very difficult to do it extremely well. But if you can create video content that is very good, you can then turn that into a podcast through audio. You can turn that into a blog post and write about it. And then you can turn the videos into more videos, the audio into audio clips, into audiograms. You can turn them into um, background clips. You can share them on radio. There's tons of things you can do. And then with written word, status updates, threads, X posts, carousels, there's so many things you can do. But those are the formats. Above the formats comes a principle that every organization needs to understand. And the principle that you need to understand are what I call the four E's. Everything that you create should fall into one of these categories. It's either educational content, engaging content, entertaining content, or empowering content. If your content doesn't educate people, so it's providing them with insight around things that they didn't know before, engage people, stir up a dialogue and stir up a conversation, engage, entertain people, put a smile on their face, maybe make them feel emotional, feel angry, adrenaline, all of those things, or empower people, celebrate people in your circle, in your community, it makes them feel great and they're more likely to share. If your content doesn't do one of those four things, no matter what, if it's video, audio, or written text, it's gonna flop. So if you look at those principles of educate, engage, and entertain, and empower, and then you think of the three formats, the question that you then ask as an organization is, what is our sweet spot and what can we do well? Some people are great at video. Those people should do video that's educational, engaging, or entertaining, or empowering. Cool. But some people are better with written word. And in those cases, I encourage those people to lean into their strengths. And then also do the research to know what type of formats your audience wants. If I'm going after Gen, what is it? What gen are we on right now? The younger folks. The what young one. The young one. Gen, gen X? No, it's not Gen X. It's some Gen Gen X. I, I, I feel like they're going backwards. I heard someone say Gen A, but okay. I, I don't know what, what Gen A is other than Forrest Gump either. saying Jenny, you know, in right. the movie. Let's call so. it Gen TikTok. <laughs> so yeah, gen let's, TikTok. let's call it the, young, the, the newest one. <laughs> yeah, the youngest one. I'm going to lean heavily into video because video is what they love. They enjoy it. They appreciate it. They want it. They engage it short form video content all the time, right? So I'm gonna think through how can I create ridiculously valuable short form content and try to think of a library of assets that they would care about. And that's where I go. But if I'm going after a C-suite executive that's 50 plus, I'm going with white papers, I'm going with webinars, I'm going with long form research pieces, talking to analysts and research back assets, that's where I'm gonna go there. So you have to start by understanding your audience. You apply that to the four E's. And then from that, you understand the formats that they are more likely to connect with and engage with. And that's how you distribute and amplify your story from there. Dude, this is, this is powerful. You, you got me thinking here. Okay. I, I want to dig into this because I think, I think this could lead to something else. Cool. We have the overarching four E's. Yeah. Okay. We have the formats of the written audio video, right? Yep. And then we have all of the different types of video written and audio things that it can be based on the platform. Right. right. Is there plat? Are you uh, platform specific when you're distributing, or are we doing every platform that we can when we're when we're creating our distribution plan? Yeah, it's directly related to resources. So if you're an organization that has tons of resources, then you should be everywhere that your audience is, and it shouldn't matter if you have. 50% or 20% adoption rates, you just go there and you be there and you're active and you're promoting it because you have the budget and the resources to do it. But if you're a little bit more resource constrained, in those situations, you want to be focused. You want to be focused on the channels that have the highest ratio of your people spending time on. So if I know that 90% of my audience is spending time on LinkedIn, then I'm all in on LinkedIn. I don't need to think about Reddit. I don't need to think about Quora. If I only have so many hours in a day and my resources are strapped, I'm going to go all in there. My dad used to always say, it's better to have one good kid than three bad. And I 100% agree that the same idea works with social. It's better to be really, really good on LinkedIn, 
before you start being mediocre and average on 15 different channels, be excellent first and then apply those lessons to the next one. So after you have unlocked excellence on one channel, then you move to the next and then you move to the next. So my belief is that you start focused and then you start to diversify your channels after excellence is achieved. How, how do you define excellence in your, in your mind? Yeah, in my mind, it's about having content market fit on a channel. So you know that you have content market fit on a channel when you have an a r- engagement ratio and you're driving results that are connected to your business goals on a specific channel that are higher than 50% of your last year's results. So when you start to see a 50% increase year after year or even quarter after quarter, then you know that you have unlocked ex- excellence because you are on a wave and you are driving growth. When you compare your ratios and your engagement rates to competitors and you can see that you're comparable, if not better than them, that's content market fit. You know that this channel is working. That is when you can move to the next one. Okay. I know people who are listening to this are going to ask this follow-up question, which is, well, what are those metrics that we should track? How do we do it? And then how do we know what our competitors' metrics are to see if we're better? Yeah. Great chance. Great question. So different channels have different ways of giving you the metrics. I always recommend that partners and clients set up some type of dashboard um, where they can get access. So whether it's Databox or Gecko Board or one of those solutions that aggregates the data into one central location for you to see it. That is one key thing that you wanna do. Now, the next step from that though, is to understand what metrics you should actually track. So using things like Google Analytics, using things like HubSpot, using some of those types of inbound marketing tools, you can actually do some attribution. So on social, what I'm always going to be looking for is social referral traffic that is associated with actual deals or, and that's from a B2B context. If it's in the B2C context, I'm looking at social referral that is associated with checkout amounts and carts and like average cart value, all of those types of things. So you are getting as close to the dollar as possible. Now, Don't get me wrong, not all marketers care about the dollar. In some industries, they actually care a lot more about brand awareness and that's what they want to be measured on and that's what their team wants them to be measured on. In those cases, you're going to measure things like impressions. How many impressions are you generating on a monthly basis from this channel and how does that compare to your competitors? That was another question. How do you track whether or not your competitors are getting more or not? On a site like LinkedIn, you actually can in the back end of your LinkedIn page, go to a section called insights and you can select five or four of your competitors. In the back end, it will now give you the data on your competitors to show their rates as it relates to growth for follower count, for engagement rates, how many posts they put up on a monthly basis. You can get that direct access right in the back end of their site. On a site like Twitter, what I like to do is actually use um, actual manual effort. So manually on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, you're looking at their competitor's follower account and you're putting it into a spreadsheet and you're actually doing a cross-reference to see their ratios and their growth versus your own. This is a little bit more manual. There isn't a way to like grab it from the API of a competitor in these channels and in that format, but those are some of the best in class approaches. And then finally, if you're thinking about it from a search lens, because search is a distribution channel as much as people don't really think of it that way, search is distribution too. You want to be actually tracking your search engine um, ranking position across all of the different keywords that you're ranking for. Tools like Ahrefs, Moz, Stat, SEMrush. There are a ton of SEO keyword tracking tools where you can see if your content is being distributed effectively across Google. Dude. You're just such a wealth of knowledge <laughs> around, <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate around this stuff. Appreciate I'm like, I'm like, damn, like, like, you know, your shit and I love it. So I, I have it. to, I have to ask, cause I could, I could go so much deeper here, but I, but I, I want to ask about AI. Yeah. Right. Because AI is playing a big role and you even alluded to it earlier. How are we using AI when it comes to content? Let's say we do figure out what our core piece is that, that let's say we do one of the four E's each right. one once a week. Those are our four pieces every week. We're right. going to do 16 pieces a month. Yeah. Let's just, let's just say that, for example, how are we using AI? What AI should we use? How do we not run away from the AI or how do we make sure that the AI is maximized? Right. Cause there's right. different ways, different tools, different things. So what's been your ideal scenario? of taking your core piece of content, one of those 10 great pieces, turning that into a ton of different content, whether it's 20 pieces of content, 30 pieces of content or whatever. And how does AI play a role in that? So are you familiar with Marvel movies and that kind of thing, comics? Okay, so Iron Man, we've got Tony Stark. Tony Stark is just a human. 
human flesh blood just like everybody else but when tony puts on his iron man suit he has superpowers i would put on my ai superpower my iron man suit and say okay what tools am i gonna put on and that's the way i think every human needs to start thinking about ai this is an augmentation tool it's not to replace us but it's to augment us and allow us to do things that we couldn't humanly do before so i have an asset that i just created I want to amplify this. I want to promote it. I want to distribute it. One of the best places to start is to use ChatGPT or one of these tools as a brainstorming buddy. Hey, ChatGPT, I just uploaded my PDF to this link. Please review it and give me a recommendation on how you think I should amplify it. It's going to read the piece and it's going to give you recos on areas that you should amplify. Cool. Now you can say to ChatGPT in natural language, can you write five status updates that can go out on my LinkedIn about this post and make sure that I include some hashtags, please. And you make sure you say please, because if the AI comes back, you don't want it to come and get you. So you're always nice to your AI. So they never know when these things are going to become sentient. Um, so you drop that in, you're going to get your responses. Now you can share that link on LinkedIn with those posts and you can schedule them in advance to go out. Now it doesn't end there. If you're using a tool like Typefully or Buffer, they actually have AI functionality built into them where you can get them to create pieces for you based off of some of these assets. It can also use AI to look at your past data to identify what time is best for you to share this stuff. So that's a great hack for you to be able to ensure that your posts are going live at the right time. I also love a tool called Jasper. What Jasper is, it's a Chrome extension that goes directly into your browser. So as you are writing content in, ja in Buffer, as you're writing content on X, on LinkedIn, you can use Jasper to finish your sentences. So if I'm writing a post on LinkedIn about this episode or about a piece that I've created, I can let Jasper write some of that copy and that content for me. Um, Another great opportunity that exists with AI today is through the video AI opportunities. So what I mean by that is you can use tools like Opus Clip, which will listen and watch a podcast episode like we're having now, and it will identify essentially these things called money moments, which are the key moment where you are essentially talking about something that is energizing, exciting, and worth sharing as a social post by itself. And then it will identify those moments and allow you to clip it out. Now you can also use AI to write the caption that goes with that clip. You can schedule it at a time that is ideal and it can sing and it can be spread. That's not it though. You can also take a lot of the content that you've created and you can say, I need to create a carousel on this post. And you can use Canva, which has AI built into it to take that blog post and have it turned into an actual carousel that can live on Instagram or live on LinkedIn. And you can have that wrapped up for you in the matter of seconds. All of the things that I essentially talk about and create once distribute forever are now able to be executed at scale on the back of AI because these tools give you superpowers to be able to take what was at one point a thing that was like, uh, Ross, this is gonna take a lot of time, to now a point where it's like, you can do this in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And yes, I still believe that there's some human intervention that is required to make sure that the quality is right, the brand voice is right, and the tone is right, but the ability to get from zero to a decent draft is accelerated. There's no stress. There's no writer's block. You can get there much faster today. It sounds like as you, as you kind of wrap up that thought, it really sounds like there are a lot of ways that you, to make what used to take to get to that 50 piece content. Let's just say this random number yeah. zero to 50 was very hard to get to. Ridiculous. Now <laughs> we can get to, we can now get to zero to 50 much quicker, but yeah. now it's about, and this goes back to the first thing you said, but now it's about making sure that that becomes great. Exactly. And that's, that's where that human element comes in. And so people that are in these positions, it's no longer, Hey, you got to spend your whole day creating five pieces of content. It's right. you got to spend your whole day editing and refining and perfecting these 10 pieces of content right. to make sure that we differentiate above yeah. the person who's just going to chat GBT and saying, Hey, create this based on this topic. Exactly. That's good. It's not great. And we want to exactly. be great. And that's what your book's all about. That's it. A hundred percent. You nailed it. And there's studies that show right now that if you're creating content that just copy and paste from chat GPT and you're publishing it as a blog post and you're not putting any human touch to it, you're at risk of being seen by Google and Google putting you down in the rankings. So it's imperative for everyone to be thinking like, all right, let's take this content and elevate it versus just press publish after a control C and control V. Yeah. Okay. I have, I have a personal question because you mentioned let's Opus Clip. We, yeah. We've used video, video.ai. Okay, um, what, cool. Have you heard of that? Or no, tell me more. Tell me more. It's very similar. It, it cool. takes the podcast, picks yep. the top clips, 
we have a template and then it just overlays the Love. the captions and the font and the style we want yeah. so I, I i've i've heard both but i i feel like opus tends to be the more uh i guess like well-known one yeah because, um, because they're more doing distribution really well it's because yeah. they're doing distribution well that's it that's the game <laughs> okay i love it so let's let's talk about one more big topic here which is that you know you mentioned something and when you go to the book website and you can go to rosssimmons.com slash book you mentioned some of the things that you're going to learn in this book and, and one of the things that i found actually really fascinating um especially for you and your market is that distribution is something that second time founders focus on mm. I, I'm, I was very intrigued by that because I, I'm curious to understand that. And I yeah. also want to see how that relates to people who are first time founders, but they can incorporate the learning lessons from someone who's been there, done that. Because I'm guessing there's a reason why second time founders are really finding distribution to be key versus yeah. creation only. So I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So this is something that I've seen um, folks like Alexis Ohanian, founder of Reddit, talk about um, Justin Kahn from uh, Twitch. Like these folks talk about this often and it's a simple idea. First time founders obsess over product. We need to create a great product. We need a product that's going to change the world, et cetera. Yep. But sometimes they create these products and then somebody else will steal the idea. A competitor will come along and create a similar idea. And what they do better than them is not have a better product but they have better distribution. And because they have better distribution, they win the game. They win the game the same way that so many of the top companies today maintain their position because they have great distribution. Let me give you a great example of this in the wild that we've all experienced. Slack has taken off. Everybody loves Slack. At the peak, when Slack was first launched, it changed the game for a lot of organizations. They were hitting millions and millions of users every quarter, just breaking the numbers. And then, Microsoft comes out, who already owns thousands of clients, thousands of customers who are starting to talk about this thing called Slack. And they say, we're going to launch Teams. And when they launched Teams, they already had something baked in. They had distribution. They could get Teams in front of their customers by snapping their fingers because everybody already had Microsoft Word. So now when you go to Microsoft Word, there's this thing about, hey, did you hear about Teams? Cool. That's built in distribution. So for organizations who are at the top, or early stage, you need to be thinking about distribution very early. How can you spread this great product that you've created? Is there partnerships that you need to capitalize on? Are there distribution angles that you can take advantage of that others have not? When you think of the early days of Airbnb, they got launched on the back of Craigslist and they used Craigslist as a distribution channel. So they took all of their listings and they put them on Craigslist and then got people to use through Craigslist their service, right? That's distribution. So when I talk to early stage founders who are so obsessed over their product, I get it, I love it, and that's great. But you have to also think about the ways in which you're going to get your story and your product out there. Otherwise, you're going to launch to crickets, you're going to have no customers, and the moment that somebody who is considered an incumbent sees that you have launched something worth doing, they'll replicate it, and then they'll ship it off to their customers. Mm, mm, what a freaking great example. Wow. As we get ready to wrap up here, all right, your book's fresh. Create once, yes. distribute forever. It's fresh. I want everyone to grab a copy. What for you, if you had one piece of advice from the book that you think would be the most impactful for someone looking to improve their distribution and their content approach, what yeah. would that be? Stop being afraid. The vast majority of the reasons why people don't distribute things is because they're afraid. They're afraid of being judged by their colleagues and peers that are yeah. going to say, oh, look, they're so promotional. They're always promoting their work. They're always promoting their stuff. Ugh, no one wants to hear that. They're afraid of that feeling. They're afraid that when they do share their work, they're going to get met with critique and feedback. Instead of having that mentality, view the feedback as a gift in a way to improve your ideas and your thoughts and your quality of content. And then finally, they're fearful that they're going to realize that the content that they've actually been investing in is not that good. And that's real. If it's not that good and you get met with crickets and you actually do everything in the book and you reach a bunch of people and the sample size tells you that it's not good, cool. That's also good feedback. Take it and realize that it might be time for you to shake things up and do something differently. But at the end of the day, my biggest piece of advice for everyone would be to walk away from fear. Do not allow fear to hold you back from distribution. Dude, what, what a killer piece of advice to wrap this thing up. So <laughs> Ross, how do we get Create Once Distribute Forever? How do we work with you? How do we follow along? Give us all the goods. 
Yeah, you can go to rossimmons.com slash book to get the book, Create Once, Distribute Forever. It's also available on all of the places that you can buy online bookstores, whether it's Amazon or Staples, Indigo, you name it. You can get it on all of the various sites. You do a quick search and you'll find it. And if you're in the wonderful world of marketing and you want to chat about marketing and how we can help with your brand doing distribution, then get in touch. You can also find me through rossimmons.com or foundationinc.co. But Again, before we wrap this up, I want to say thank you to you. Thank you for giving me the time to share. Thank you for doing this type of stuff for the community and for the industry. Um, I know that you've been in the game for a while, adding value to the ecosystem. So thank you for all that you do. Dude, I appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the show. It's been it's been a pleasure after eight eight years of, of knowing and, and, and a quarter of us becoming good friends. This That's is just it. the beginning for us, man. So I'm excited. And for everyone that, that just listened to this, I have two challenges for you. Number one is grab a copy of Create Once, Distribute Forever. That's when you could check off the list right away. But my second challenge is an action challenge. Mm. You heard Ross talk about the four E's, okay? I want you to pick one of the four E's and I want you to create a great, not a mediocre, I want you to create a great piece of content based on one of the four E's and start distributing the shit out of it. That's my challenge to you. Thank you guys for listening. Another great episode in the books. I will see you on the next one. Peace.